Welcome to this live session of Coatings Talk. I'm your host, Jim Kunkel. I'm a certified protective coating specialist. And for the last 15 years, I've worked in the global protective coatings industry. Here on Coatings Talk, you'll get the latest information and in industry best practices for the global protective coatings industry. Uh, and also the corrosion industry as well. This live broadcast and all content and materials produced and distributed by Coatings Talk and myself does not represent or reflect any positions or opinions of AXO Nobel International. During this live broadcast, you'll have the opportunity to post comments that I can include into this episode. And I'm so very grateful to have on Coatings Talk, Kim Scott with Maui Powder Works. And also, she's the host of the Powder Coder Podcast. And Mario... <laughs> Casino? Do I say that right, Mario? Quisano, yeah, it doesn't Quisano, matter. Quisano, close it's enough, okay. right? It's okay like that, yep. <laughs> Who is a powder coating subject matter expert with extensive practical experience and knowledge. Kim and Mario, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. It's great to have you. Now, before we get into our conversation on powder coating best practices, tips, and techniques for a flawless finish, Let's do a proper introduction on both of you. Kim, if you could please tell us about Maui Powder Works and importantly, um, what fo the followers and subscribers from your podcast can, can gain from listening and also watching on YouTube. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're streaming to my channel right now too, yeah? Um, at least we're trying. <laughs> it, it <laughs> I'll does, have to check it, back it, later. It, it does show, show that. I do see the extra channels on here. So oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for having me. And Mario, it's so good to finally meet you. Finally, for yes. Hat tip to Maui <laughs> Powderworks. Thank you for wearing your swag today. Um, <laughs> you know, Maui Powderworks, we kind of started as a, a side hustle. Uh, we were already in the paint coating industry here on Maui, which doesn't seem like it would be very much, but it was actually. Uh, we used to go into vacation rentals and upgrade their furniture by refinishing it and stuff. And, you know, it's really hard to get, you know, timely pieces. And a lot of times things were one color and they wanted to switch it to a different one. So we learned how to uh, create wood effects on you know uh different kinds of whitewash pieces we had a bazillion of that back in the 90s so uh, from there um ross you know through our interactions with our regular painting customers you know he was asked to do a lanai furniture set you know an outdoor furniture set and and he's like yeah sure i can paint that up for you he goes no i don't want that I want powder coating. And all of a oh, sudden yeah. that, you know, Ross just went. I remember that story. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was that was the journey for us. Um, and so slowly, you know, he just started to get a name for himself. And then in 2010, we just kind of went, OK, we're ready to do this full time. Um, you know, the podcast came about gradually. It wasn't like anybody heard about a podcast or was doing any podcasting back in 2010. But I did start a blog because I was thinking, well, if Ross is going to do this, then what am I going to do? He's effectively retired us out of the painting business, right? So um, thanks to uh, a friend of mine named Danielle, who's been on our show many times. She's a marketing genius. Mm -hmm. And... Um, she said, oh, just blog, you know, and next thing you know, I started blogging and the blog just went global. Um, and that's when, you know, when you start to see like the purview of the world, <laughs> you know, so to speak, especially with podcasting now, because you can be anywhere, any, anytime and stuff, you know, it really kind of changed my perspective about Maui Powder Works because we've always had the mission of you know, partnering with people that are passionate about performance finishes. And it's funny because it doesn't matter what we do, whether we're blogging or we're podcasting or we're refinishing uh, somebody's rims or architectural project, that mission, 
is carries through with everything we do and even carries through to our new launch of the patina of the our patinas and powder lux so there you have it that's the whole story in five minutes <laughs> well you know the thing with with your podcast too you don't have to be into powder coating or into the industry because you cover a lot of different topics, you mm -hmm. know, and, and that's yeah. the thing to look at. Yes. So I encourage everyone, you know, after this broadcast ends to get a, go to a podcast provider. Uh, you have a YouTube channel. You can go check out the videos or listen to the audio or both because um, there's a lot of topics that you do cover that are not, you know, exclusively all the time, 100%. Um, for powder coating. So um, I, I think that's there what There are a lot of struggles in our industry. Yeah. There, and there is no, there seems to be no end to it, right? It just evolves <laughs> into something else. I think for me, you know, my, um, my perspective is more along the side of business and yeah. running a business, um, you know, and, but, you know, for the most part, uh, I just want to get the shy individuals that are experts in their field, you know, to just share their story and uh, share their expertise so that others can learn and grow in knowledge because there is so much to learn about this industry. It's like I said, it's ever evolving, right? So, um, you know, it, it is more business oriented, uh, but, you know, uh, I think that what we're if if you will allow me at the end of the show i would like to share a very special announcement uh, uh regarding our next level f with the podcast and stuff so great yeah. excellent some breaking news i love it i love it yeah, yeah. now now with uh, mario some viewers might remember back in september of 2023 yes. mario and i did a joint technical virtual presentation with the powder coating conclave in India. And that was a very wow. good uh, technical conference. And it was so, we were so gracious and, and grateful that the organizers allowed us to attend it virtually. And, uh, you know, we got a lot out of the, out of the conference itself. And then also to, it gave a good opportunity for Mario and I to kind of interact with, you know, an industry, uh, a market that, you know, we typically would not interact in any given day. Um, so exactly. Mario, why don't you uh, go ahead? Let's uh, let the viewers know. There might be a couple of viewers out there that might not know who you are. If you could provide your professional and your technical background, and also talk about your passion for powder. Powder coating. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, Kim. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I know you have invited me to your show, but uh, I, I mean, my English is not pretty good. But I mean, we. we we are going to well, do it. We're going to come on the show it. soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, my, my name is Mario Quiseno. I am a powder coating applicator here in Canada. Uh, my background is uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, I am from Colombia. And uh, what else? I, I started to work as a loader in a, in a powder coating uh, painting line, just loading and loading and loading and the when the my boss asked me, hey, why don't you apply as a painter and as applicator? And I say, yeah, yeah, but I don't know anything about it. No, I will train you. And then I start to fall in love with, with, with all of this. I mean, for me, paint was just uh, liquid, no this uh, dry finish uh, processes. So for me, it was kind of new. And I started to read and study. And suddenly, you know, I start to to get a lot of knowledge, try to find somebody who knows a lot about powder coating. And I got into Kim's ch uh, um, uh, channel in YouTube and I started to listen to her um, podcast, really interesting podcast. It's uh, more related to, to business, but I mean, between uh, the conversation, they give us some, they, gave, they they give us like, they gave like some tips that I was just writing down <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, but yeah, I fell in love. I really fell in love. I have made two courses of powder coating, one with the old school, uh, old college in Alberta. It was online. And another one in Udemy. 
but I'm planning to study like 101, 202. Now I become a member of the uh, Ke Chemical Coders Association International. And then thanks to the, oh, but this is the, the, the best part. So I started to, to, to feel this passion about powder coating. So I started to write articles about it like professional articles. So I was taking English lessons. One of the classes was writing and then suddenly everything matched and started to write um, articles in English. And thanks to that, I, I met uh, Jim. Me, uh, Jim read one of my articles and he said, hey, why don't you participate here in, in, a, in a podcast? And I say, okay, no problem. So after that, some guy from the Spanish community from Mexico, he said that they asked me to write articles in Spanish. And I say, hey, I don't have experience to write it in Spanish, but let's try. So now on, I have like 20 articles uh, uh, written, like two in English, and also this participation in the international conference about powder coating in India. I just contacted them. I like the same process with, with Kim uh, and Jim, like uh, interacting through the <clears throat> through internet, and they invited me to um, give a presentation. Of course, I told them, look, I don't have a lot of experience. I have been working as a powder coated applicator for two years, and the rest is what I have studied. And they say, okay, why don't you uh, try to find a friend who is going to be an specialist, and then you pre you present uh, together, and then Jim said, "I am, I am in," and we presented, and it, it was pretty good, pretty good. It was pretty. I good. love that. I love that story. I love it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Just for 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 the audience, the information that I will cover is based on my own research. It doesn't have to do anything with my actual employee, not even the, their opinion or the nothing just my own research watching uh, kim and jim's uh, videos and reading some books and so on but you yeah. see jim you know um this is what i love about powder coating um yeah. the passion yeah and it really it's about taking all these people that are in our industry and their passion for it and connecting it with modalities that yeah allow others to learn and grow uh you know i mean this is this is just beautiful to hear yeah and, and the one thing mario didn't talk about he's also a technical content writer for infocorrosion.com Info which is a spanish language yes. publication that's uh you know very very great uh, publication so you know also too after the broadcast check out infocorrosion.com um my background, what's interesting is I'm in industrial coatings right now, but prior to this, I was prior to what I'm doing now, I was into I was into powder coating. I worked for a steel service center in the Pittsburgh market where, where I'm based out of. And uh, in uh, roughly around 2008 um, time frame, uh, the company had taken over a fabricator that had a roughly about a 700 plus foot powder coat line. And it was, okay, now we're into not only being a steel service center, but we can have product fabricated. We can also have it powder coated. And then also we're going to be going out there for powder coating jobs as well. So, you know, that's kind of my tie in with the powder powder coating side. You know, the thing that I find when, you know, you talk to people about different type of, you know, coatings that are out there, ways to protect, you know, assets and structures, and it could be anything. And the one thing I think that probably a lot of people don't appreciate is that powder coating has uh, some major advantages over liquid coatings and other yes. coating methods. Kim, you being a, a provider um, of the service of powder coating, you know, what mm -hmm. are some of the advantages of powder coating, let's say over liquid coating, not to pit them against each other, but what is the, what are some of the big advantages with powder coating? Well, mainly uh, powder coating encapsulates the metal, right? You know, so, I mean, aside from the usual no drip, you know, uh, perfect finish. I mean, that's, I think, you know, what coders and, and 
you know, end customers are really looking for, right, is the perfection of it all, right? Yep. Um, and and you, you know this because, like most people, you start with painting metal, right? And then you realize, you know, whether, whatever, whether you're an applicator or you're someone that's receiving the painted metal, you realize how, um, you know, how difficult it is, difficult. you yes. know, it, it, it could literally sit there and look, you know, been sitting there for days drying and then, and on the outside, it looks dry. And then you go to load it up in the truck or deliver it or whatever. And then, you know, there's your <laughs> fingernail yes. or your thumb imprint because it's still drying. It's still and fresh, it's still drying. You know? yes. I mean, that is yeah. the biggest, you know, um, and that's the number one question that people ask too, uh, is how soon um, can I put this into service or how yeah. soon can I pick it up? How soon can I take it to my auto tech? <laughs> how soon can <laughs> I install it? And it's like, when I hear that, you know, on the phone, you know, and the sigh of relief, right? Because everybody's in a rush to get it installed or do something. They've got this timeline that they have to keep. And that's another beauty of powder coating, right? Is no matter, even if we are, because we're end of the line, we're finishers, right? Yeah. And even when we're on a tight time schedule, uh, if you're good with your processes, uh, like Ross can, I turn around and I look back in the shop and he's just sitting there, you know, waiting for, you know, he moves so quickly that you really, you know, I mean, you could move on to the next project if you wanted to and stay busy, but literally like he can do a whole rack in a short amount of time. Right. So the beauty of the speed of it all too, is just another great aspect. Yeah. It's, it's like uh, the pieces, is going to be ready in 45 minutes yeah. i mean the, the the yeah the customer can go and you drink like a, a coffee superhero, and right? then they, <laughs> yeah that that surprised me a lot uh, i mean when i started to work uh in in the powder coating line uh it was surprised me like the 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 piece goes to i work in a conveyor line so it yeah. goes to the pretreatment and they dries then we applicate the powder they go to the oven and boom, 38, 38, 45 minutes and the piece is ready, ready to use. You yeah. don't have to wait more. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great point about, you know, kind of with the spe speed of, again, proper application. There's we're, when we're going to cover some of the we're definitely going to be covering some process in which it's done. I think for me is that you get you get the protection, but also to. A lot of people who are going to be powder coating or they're really in tune with the aesthetics you know, the look and the feel. And Kim, you know, you have a, a patina effect line that you have now, yeah. you know, talk about something like with patinas, you know, uh, you know, are those gaining in popularity? Are they, you know, are you starting to see people saying, hey, I want, I want a patina finish? You know, it, we're just getting launched, but yes. I mean, I've known all along, right? So like, uh -huh. I, you know, uh, behind me here, I have framed our uh, featured article in uh, powder coating tough magazine and uh a lot of it is just getting the word out because the architectural industry is huge it's 80 billion so like how do we find in all of that noise how do we find this message that we want to deliver right um so i think we'll get there but it's going to take some time yeah it's you know as i'm you know, doing my day-to-day -day work here as the office manager for a small job shop. At the same time, around the world in the UK, we had a powder coater uh, take our finishes oh. uh, to just this week to the surface design show, which I don't know much about it, but I think it's huge. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we're celebrating these milestones kind of quietly Good. in the background. Um, but yeah, Ross ended up making samples for them um, and they handed them out. And so far we heard that it was just a huge hit. So we've never been to a show or any kind of expo uh, yet. Uh, so it's nice to see like us being behind the scenes and helping other coders that are already there 
ready and have access to those architecturals and you know architectural marketplaces mm -hmm. and people that will get us out there in front you know what i mean yeah so, i think what yeah i think what if you're in industrial coatings you're in powder coatings a lot of what typically happens is people don't know what they don't know and it's really coming down to exactly. educating and informing everybody and then also having an helping them gain an understanding of why it's important because you know you can have applications in you know even in an industrial location where it makes sense to to really bring to bear you know liquid coatings linings powder coatings there's you know even you know i'm going to be doing some uh, specials when it talks about metallizing and things like that so you know there's so many things that you can really kind of bring uh, to an owner or to an architect or and but you really have to educate and inform them and you yeah. know help them gain an understanding of what yeah. what can be what's the possibility here and and the good thing the good thing of, of powder coating that i notice is like uh, there are no secrets like everybody wants to help everybody I, that is why I started to write uh, articles in Spanish because I want the Spanish, the the, the, the Spanish community to be together, like uh, like the information in English. I mean, everybody's sharing how to uh, paint a Faraday cage, how uh, why it's important to have a good grounding, uh, uh, why it's important to have a good pretreatment without talking about brands. I noticed that in in uh, uh, Kim's. Uh, um, uh, podcasts like everybody's sharing their knowledge like everybody wants that the community is going to grow and to do the things better yeah, yeah and if me, i could add to that i mean some of the frustrations that i have uh as a podcaster you know like it's more about expertise not about selling something and i think that majority of information that's being uh driven or derived is from vendors already in the industry that have something to sell right uh -huh. and you know there there's nothing objective about it uh and i'm looking for objective information expertise and 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 stuff like that and i think that in hopefully uh we can enter the marketplace uh with more of a you know more of a less salesy type of educational process um, and platform than um something that you're yeah it's a free weekend two-day course and then they want me to buy you know um mm -hmm. this oven or this equipment or whatever and i i just want to kind of break that I, I want to break. I, yeah. I hope the industry needs to know that it, it needs to break away from that, at least on some level. Right. You know. That's yeah, but good that's point. good. It's true. It's true. Yeah. All, all the la lately, all the webinars are just trying to show their product. But yeah, yeah that, that's not good. I mean, I prefer like uh, Kim is going to do like uh, tips to paint better. Because in powder coating is nothing is written. For instance, when I am going to paint a Faraday cage, I use uh, rework settings, and my coworker use another settings. Um, the results are the same. So it's I don't know. Yeah, there's not coating. one static process. I exactly. think is what you're saying. And exactly. yeah, and every job shop is different. Um, yeah, you're right. You know, um, and that. That's, you know, like I, I said earlier in a podcast that was um, just released recently was like, you don't know until you don't know, right? You're, until yeah. you know, right? <laughs> and I think that was a perspective that Ross ended up when he was teaching some, you know, he had to go to the mainland and to the UK to teach uh, our specialty exotic finishes. And, you know, every time he goes, he's always looking around for what it is that they do that's maybe different than what he does, you know, and there is a unique, there's going to be a uniqueness to every plant and every factory, yeah. every job shop, uh, just because of just either the type of product that they're powder coating or the level of uh, expertise that they have. 
um, the the type of uh, coatings that they're putting on. I mean, there's so many variables there, which makes it exciting. It makes powder coating exciting. Um, but, you know, he kind of picks up, tries to pick up a tip every now and then, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to kind of further his own, his own mastery. You know, there's always something to learn. Yeah, yes. you're so, so true about that. So let's go ahead and let's uh, kind of open up and talk about the best practices side of it before we really get into that that there are there are two types of of powder coatings there's thermal set and thermal plastic and a thermal set it refers to a, the process where the you know the coating undergoes a chemical cross-linking reaction you know during the curing uh -huh. we we're talking about liquid coatings how they cure versus uh, powder coating which is is totally uh different but in a way sometimes sometimes a little similar it also it permanently seals it permanently well, i think uh, uh jim is there are different up. oh my back okay here we go there are different types of thermoset powder coating such as epoxy polyester acrylic polyurethane and each have different properties and applications now thermoplastic refers to the process where the coating melts and it flows onto the substrate when it's heated and then it with those, though, they could also be remelted and reshaped when heated again. So, when you're looking at thermoplastic powder coatings, um, you're looking at um, polyethylene, polypropylene, nylon, polyester, uh, polyvinyl chlor uh, chloride, and each with uh, really different properties and applications. You know, hopefully, I did justice on the <laughs> definitions. I, I mean, it's too, a new. So. It's kind of newish, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And there is another 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 type of uh, powder coating that is the UV curing that are powders that cure at really low temperature. Yeah. But yeah, but I don't know if they they are just putting their uh, uh, UV curings in 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 thermosets or thermoplastics. I don't know, but. Yeah, I just read that there are three types now. For yes, some people. and <laughs> the, the the latest two are you know kind of the newer the ones we're talking about now. I think that um, from what I've read, because we don't do that here, um, we're we're pretty much thermoset only. Me too. Um, that's what I'm used to. Yeah, and that's what most people are if they know anything about powder coating. That's what they're used to hearing. Um, uh, there are some coders out there, and what I've read about these thermoset is th they can apply it much thicker um, for the, uh, you know, and, you know, it, which is ideal for extreme outdoor and mm -hmm. longer needed uh, surfaces and color through, like, you know, playgrounds and uh, benches in, you know, outdoor benches in a public space, uh, could be rail, you know, like stanchions, uh, for, you know, a rail or a guard guard rail kind of thing. I, I could see a lot of that. And in addition to that, in furthering, now that they have this science, right, this chemistry available and powder coaters are succeeding in it. Um, they're now reaching out into, uh, plastic bottles and recycling and ups, you know, like that whole like circular model where we're taking plastic bottles that we drink water out of and then taking that and repurposing it and uh, upcycling it or, you know, um, back into something more, um, you know, it, it really changes the dynamic of the thinking and the mindset yeah. of just a one a linear model to a more circular model that yeah and, and it also can help tie in if people have green initiatives or they're looking at oh, yeah. or other things so you know that's the other aspect of it too so let's go ahead and we're going to talk about the coding process and, and its main components mario you and i've had this conversation because it no matter what part of the coatings industry that you work in the surface preparation is so important. It's really, Could you kind really of go through some of the steps on how to kind of prepare a oh, surface that goes into a powder coating line? Of course, yeah. Uh, there are uh, like three types of um, of uh, preparation. There is um, mechanical, uh, oh, actually two, uh, mechanical and chemical. And the chemical is like uh, you can do it manually 
or you can do it you know automatically in these um, machines that are like uh, uh, from three to eight stages and each stage has a chemical to to prepare the surface for uh, uh, the powder coating application so and the mechanical it's like some blasting uh sanding and all those kinds like uh, you prepare the surface to be painted yeah so there are like the the, the type of uh, of um, surface preparation in my case i know about uh, the five stages equipments to prepare the the the, the surface to be uh, uh, painted but uh, that's that's all the the rest is because i have read something about it and actually kim i forgot to tell you so i'm making some courses about nanotechnology nanotechnology really? there are particles that it's no, there are it's more like uh, uh this uh a, a hair uh, one piece of air and they are training they they are calling smart particles because the particle as soon as touches the surface of the substrate start to clean it but nanometrically that means the 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 piece is not going to have any oxide anything on the surface it's i'd like to know more about that clean. that's curious yeah yeah it's it's amazing i i i started to read about nanotechnology and then they are in uh, and also there was an an indian guy in the conference uh i forgot the name now and he was explaining uh how they are using uh, nanotechnology in the pretreatments and the chemicals that they are using they are pre they are using uh, they are not uh, now uh, adding chrome uh, phosphates uh, to the to the chemicals right. and it was really 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 surprised to me about that because there are just particles that you cannot see but the particles are as smart. I mean, oh wow! So me, you're saying crazy. it acts as a as a pre coating, like a pre coating. While yes, it's actually, no, it's and, and also, and pre -coats. no, also uh, in uh, some of the, the powder coatings nowadays, they have nanotechnology now. That like it's like oh, well, nanotechnology um, types are three dimension yeah. zero dimension one and dimension two and uh, powder coating is using all of them power uh, dim dimension zero is particles that are single particles uh dimensions one is like nanotubes nanotubes and the electronics yeah. the electrons are going through that pipes or that tubes and uh, uh, dimension uh, two is like uh, layers so yes. Powder, now uh, uh, the powder coating industry, no, how can I say, the, the guys who produce the powder, they are implementing this to them, to, the, to that. Well, let me um, tell you something. Us girls know about that kind of stuff already. It's called hydrating primer. Oh, you put yeah. it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they are face. using cosmetics too. They are using <laughs> cosmetics too. You know, if you can break things down, you know, you're talking about nanoparticles and stuff like that. And they get, you know, like a lot of times people go, oh, you know, like, oh, am I going to understand what he's talking about? And yeah. And the thing is, is when you break it down into something as simple as, oh, when I go to put my makeup on and I want to fill in my fine lines, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you use a hydrating primer, you know. So um, when you look at it like that, you know, it's it's it, it simplifies it, obviously, to, a, you know, a more simple, hilarious version. You know, I'm just bringing in some comedic, you know, stuff right now. <laughs> but like, you know, I mean, when you think about what it does right you know and you yeah. think about it in simpler terms it sounds actually really ideal um and only makes the coatings want to last longer you know i mean i exactly. from what i'm hearing you know i think that uh you know what we do a lot here is restoration and that for us uh pre-treatment is everything because you know something will come in rusty and then you know they want it done and they don't want that rust to come back and it's like 
Well, you know, it depends on how rusty it is, right? You know, uh, if it's already falling off in your hands when you get the piece, you know, there's only going to be so much that we can do, right? Because that exactly. rust is a virus and it's embedded in the metal. Yeah. Um, if it's surface rust and mill scale rust, you know, that's not so bad because the products we use for pretreatment here, once they're blasted, you know, there there's still some rust mill um, microscopically, you know, you, you yeah. see white metal, you see it, it looks pretty, it looks like there's no rust on there, but really, you know, you still need to do your pretreatment. And I think that that, um, in terms of, uh, some of the smaller custom coders that are out there that are just getting into the business, you know, it's an easy one to overlook, um, you know, but it's so pretreatment is literally everything, uh, exactly. to, a perfect finish and a longer lasting finish, you know? Yeah. As, yeah, as much wow. as you talk about rust too, if you're getting something that might be exposed to the environment, it has biological elements on it as well. And, you know, getting rid of that is, is important as well. So that, you know, you're not going over a, a, a dirty substrate or a uh, yeah. just contaminated, contaminated. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Right. Exactly. You know, very good. Very um, good. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, let's, for, for yeah. me, uh, sorry, sorry, Jim. No, oh, for me, retreatment is one of the keys to have a really smooth, nice finish uh, coat, and Excellent. it's going to last a lot Long because that with the retreatment, the chemicals are going to. I mean, they convert the substrate like in a magnet with the grounding, of course. And so the powder is going to stick or synthesize to the substrate. So it's going to be smooth. And, and you'll have less flaws in the finish or have mm -hmm. to deal with outgassing as much, right? You know, exactly. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You get rid of that, those uh, contaminants, right? You know, and that's really what prepping the surface is all about. Exactly. Yeah. So we have Ross with us in spirit because Kim's got him working right now. <laughs> She's and, probably taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing with Ross, amazing in the skill in the trade, he can do a master class and really, when it comes to application, really kind of show the magic behind powder coating. You know, Kim, when we talk about, you know, the application part of it, you have customers who are coming with existing product material. Maybe they've got something fabricated that you're working on, and it could yeah. be multiple different types of components. It does automotive to something that's right. outside, like a park bench or a sign or anything like that. How important is it when it comes to the application, having the right equipment, the right technique, and Mario, I know you can talk about technique as well, uh -huh. but also too, to make sure that you have that skill level in the applicators that are working. Yeah, I mean, people bring us problems, right? Yeah. <laughs> every, every customer brings us a problem, right? A problem we have to solve. And, um, you know, I don't know. I guess it's just the way he approaches the problem uh, to find that solution. And then because he's so good at it, he can cut. And I want to say he cuts steps out because he's still pre-treating it. But, you know, he's bringing down that restoration job to a least common denominator right? To simplify yes. processes and methodologies so that you're not wasting time, exactly. right? You know, and that's, mm -hmm. that is really the mastery that, that the level I think that you're talking about is, you know, it, he's time. managed to master the time. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, I think that every powder coating company in anywhere in, in the world, it always has to deal with that right because because <clears throat> the more time you can save the more productivity and the more profitability and scaling you can do um 
And so you're constantly, you know, having to battle that. And then you add employees in there uh, and, you know, you got to keep them busy and stuff like that, it, you know. And then how do you do that when you have, you know, for, for an example, you have, you know, two sets of rims, you have a deadline on an architectural project or a new fabrication that needs to be done by a certain, you know what I mean? And then you have, um, you know, all this other little in between -y stuff that just is nagging you in, you know, in boxes and ordering powder and stuff like that. How do you manage that? Sometimes we've been kind of, you know, for the most part, the production and the workflow seems to work out for us. Like, it just seems like this guy, you know, we had a little bit of hecticness last week. Uh, but, you know, we have been caught in times of, I don't know what it was. It was just like the types of jobs that were kind of coming in and nothing seemed to work. Right. It was just like, Oops. you know, it, it can, mm -hmm. it's easy when you're doing parts contracting for, you know, you've got this guy's parts and then you got another guy's parts and then you, you know, it's easy to manage that to, you know, I'm sure there are problems within that even as well, but, but, but how do you manage something when you're in a job shop that is so versatile, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. The versatility yeah. that can actually cause problems in production and turnaround times, stuff like that, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not the same to apply, uh, um, epoxy, then a polyester, everything changed. Yeah, I don't know why, that, yeah. but it's, yeah, if you pass too fast, it's light, or if you pass too slow, it's heavy. Yeah, it's, I, I understand what, what, what Kim's saying, and yeah. Yeah, That's it really, cool. it really comes down to making sure that, you know, the, the, the craft workers you have on the teams, you know, they, they do understand technique, also proper equipment setting. And that they fully really understand because they have to really kind of get in tune with that whole process and if they're not in tune with it everything's out of sync and that can cause uh problems i you know i remember times where we would have to take you know scotch bright pads to to do some you know repair let's say and 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 go back at things and things like that so you want to make sure you can deal with it up front that at the end you're going to have lesser when you're doing your quality assurance quality control, excuse me, mm -hmm. before it goes to the customer, you're going to be able to hopefully minimize or eliminate any type of issues that you're going to have. And, you know, Mario, you were talking about, I wanted to move on to curing. You know, there's different ways where, you know, chemical reaction and the cross-linking that happens. And then also you're dealing with, uh, you know, UV lights to kind of melt and harden the powder itself. Um, in your experience with the with the cure, um, how application is? We talk about preparation being super important. Application mm -hmm. is important, but how critical when it comes to that cure? You know, when if you're putting something through an oven, you know, how how much uh, of importance is that process? Yeah, actually, yes, the, it's really important because the the oven has to be ready at the right temperature to receive the piece of the substrate in order to put it there because there are some uh, like defects or something that uh, that, that you can see if you uh, don't, uh, um, if you take the piece before the time curing or if the, 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 the oven is cold, they are going to appear like a, a dry paint or sometimes a, you are going to see like uh, it's not properly cured, and so so the um, it's not the shining. The what is the word for that? Like you don't see it like a smooth uh, in a in a nice in a nice way. You see like orange uh, peel. Orange yeah, peel, yeah, like no orange peel, but more like uh, mate, and you want it the oh, other. Yeah. Yeah, the other right. uh, yeah. What is the opposite of uh, of mate? I don't remember. Uh, Shine, no. Glass. Uh, you talking about glass? glass? Yeah, like glass. Exactly. Sorry, I was thinking in Spanish. So the glass. If you take all, or the um, the piece before completing the time to cure, it's yeah. going to lose the glass. Or if you leave it there into the oven, the piece is going to be overcooked. So if you are going to paint white, 
in, and it, the piece is overcooked, you are going to see kind of brownish in some parts of the piece. So it, cure is really, really yeah. important. White's the worst um, in terms of curing. Uh, even when we've, you know, and I think it has something to do with the tight, the the white titanium in white, right? It, it, and this is a problem with paints too. It's not, it, it's something to do with that. I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not the chemist, you know, I could be wrong, but we have uh, on several occasions had to clear coat over a white, um, Oh yeah. you know, just to, and at the risk of yellowing it, you know, mm -hmm. by putting a clear coat on there, um, you know, because the white did not harden, even though we cured it to temp and we followed all the directions and stuff like that, it's still, it was just this particular brand or, or something. Um, we, uh, it was for a helicopter company and it was kind of important, you know, and I, we were a little embarrassed on that, you know, of course we, you know, didn't charge them to put the clear coat on because, you know, we stand by our product and our applications, but, you know, it's, a, it's been, I think white's been the most frustrating. Um, so people that are powder coating white, I, I hear you, you know, like, yeah. I understand, you know, the, the struggles they have, you know, and um, it, it just, it can be problematic um, in terms of, bringing that, you know, black, I don't, doesn't seem to have that. We never seem to have a problem with blacks and sheens and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, yeah, as opposed yeah. to other colors, right. You know, so that's true. Yeah. But the curing yeah. is really important. If you don't take care of your curing, you lost the trust transfer efficiency, the bill film on all the things that you are were paying attention during the application is gone if you don't pay attention, as I yeah. said, to the curing time. So one other thing to pay attention is going to be powder coating safety and built into an operation built into the industry. And it's all the coating industries are, are, are the same when it comes to a big emphasis and focus on safety. There are so many potential hazards and really risk associated with powder coating. Yeah. You, you have the potential for, you know, fire, explosion, inhalation, you know, yeah, and skin contact. And so, you know, having proper PPE, just like Mario is showing there, you know, you want to make sure you're able to protect the eyes and protect the, the lungs and everything like that. You know, yeah. gloves, goggles, overalls and things like that. You know, how, you know, what are some of the, let's put it this way in both of your experiences um what's probably the most important thing you would say to somebody when they're looking to if they're looking to be an applicator you know related to ppe what kind of advice would you give them if that makes sense what, uh, kim you, what about a uh, grounding in order to avoid the the, the sparks and maybe cause an explosion <laughs> that's just something that i just yeah just, that's yeah, great. to have a perfect grounding because well, sometimes when you are applying the, the the powder, you can see some sparks because it's like an right. electric it's, it's electric circuit. So it's really dangerous to have those sparks. So it's better to have a perfect grounding. If you have a perfect grounding, everything's going to be okay. So for me to kiss pretreatments and grounding and the rest is... Yeah, is I mean, the guns themselves are pretty like you know, press the button kind of thing. You know, once you get oh, yeah. them all set up, it's just pretty much like, you know, here you go, press this for that, press this for that, right? Um, but, you know, I think to back it up just a little bit, uh, you have, it, 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 it has to be about workforce, right? And the people that you yeah. hire, because yep. there has to be some level of, um, you can have all these policies and, and all this stuff available to them, but if they, if, you know, if they don't have the common sense, you know, uh, yes. yeah. <laughs> I mean, if they don't have that common sense to, 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 you know, and that's what makes hiring so difficult right? Because there are a lot of people out there that are not, we've lost our, our critical thinking a lot, uh, 
probably because of devices. Um, you know, I don't know. We that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other a corridor of topic. But you know, how do you find somebody that doesn't have experience but has a common sense or common you know some kind of basic understanding um, of how to operate things? You know. Yeah. Uh, and and you could have all of that in available to them in the world with the OSHA and the you know this and don't do this and don't do that and all that. But if it, if the person doesn't have common sense, you know, and I'll give you this. Ross was cleaning the booth. He just told me this story. Like I'm not kidding you. Like last night, <laughs> um, he was cleaning. He was vacuuming out the because we have those uh, in the booth. We have those deep weld uh, filters now. They're not just the straight up panel ones like we used to have. Um, <laughs> good luck with the common sense. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes, yes yeah. that's true. Um, and so he was, he decided to vacuum out the, uh, right, and the booth is on and, you know, it's got all the sucking and stuff like that and he's and all of a sudden, he felt this overwhelming sense of static electricity in the air because he was right. Because it was yeah, and he's realizing now, I am dustifying this powder. It's getting sucked into an electronic device, and is you know so even understand how do you explain to somebody what that static? You have to be having all five senses right to. Yes. So it's a five sense thing and it's a common sense thing. And a lot of people just don't have that these days. A lot of uh, just, I don't know if it's a generational thing. I don't know. So this is, you know, my biggest, I guess, drum that I'm beating these days is workforce. You know, yeah. how do we educate workforce? How do we quantify a qualified workforce? You know, um, the greater industry people and they've come on the show several times discuss oh we're just going to go to the colleges and get well your problem is different than coders and job shop owners okay you're coming from a vendor point of view and you're just looking for your next distributor or your next uh rep or or manager or yes. you know whatever okay that's not our problem we're not going to find those people in colleges okay <laughs> you know so i don't know what the answer is today but um you know, it, it's going to take a a whole industry, a holistic approach to to that. So uh, that's all I have to say about PPE. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's true. It's common sense. I mean, if I have an electronic device or electric device that is throwing power, I cannot touch the the, the nozzle or the no, 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 no. I mean, yeah. it's common sense. But uh, uh, as uh, Kim says, I mean, it's part of the... So don't do what uh, Ross does. Yeah. <laughs> the moral of the story, right? <laughs> That's yeah, a safety. Yeah. That's the right. toolbar, but, tool, toolbox no. talk for but today. He put, the, he put it together, right? You know, but yeah. it took five senses to do that. It took the, the you know, he knows that buildup of the, you know, of this uh, static yeah. feel. You know, uh -huh. how do you teach somebody that, you know, to be aware, yeah. have a level of awareness like that, you know? Perfect, perfect. We got about five minutes left. And before I do a closeout, what I wanted to do is make sure um, related to any type of uh, contact information for you both and also the promotion you were talking about or the breaking news, Kim. So let's go ahead and go to you, Kim, first, because I'm very curious of what you're going to say. Yes, me too. Let me take notes. <laughs> Ah, um, <laughs> well, first off, you can find us uh, pretty much everywhere on the internet as far as the podcast is concerned. Yeah. Um, at Maui Powder Works, pretty much anywhere as far as the job shop is concerned. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, we're, first of all, I'm going to be attending um the powder coating institute's powder week so if you're uh in the area of orlando um i believe it's march uh, 11th 12th and 13th um that week i will be there i'd love to meet you 
Um, I'm, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I always meet new and interesting people. Uh, it gets me out of the house, so out off the island, so to speak. So it's really nice to, you know, kind of network with people and stuff like that. So I, I, I try to go as often as I can. Um, and then the big announcement is that we are too going live on March 1st. And this is going to be a deep dive live forum with six coders. Good. Uh, we're still debating on topics. Uh, the topics that we have come up with could easily be a live show each. Uh, and I was just thinking about that today going, yeah. wow, how are, you know, look, we've hard, you know, we, we've talked, we've gone yeah. on all different uh, journeys. Do a series. Here. Yeah. Do a series. Yeah. I mean, it could That's just good. be one topic for each Sounds one good. because I was going to try to cram it all in. You know me, I like to add it all and <laughs> you know, just do as many little tricks and stuff and fun and, and have as much fun as possible. But, you know, in just talking how we've talked and it's taken an hour, uh, you know, yeah. it's easy to uh, just do one topic. So, uh, you know, it's always been the podcast point of view to share people's stories and journeys. And so that's what this is going to be about. Uh, all of mm -hmm. these gentlemen have been on the show before, but not shared their own personal experiences and joy, you know, talk to expertise and problem solving in their industry, but not like talked about their, themselves in their own personal stories and journeys. So I think it's going to be a great first live for sure. I, uh, could you add a section like a tips for powder coating to them? Like at the end or to, I to don't add know. at the end. Okay, yeah. yeah. Could you give a tip to the audience or somebody? Yeah. Well, we're going to have, Chrome horror stories for sure. Uh, oh, yeah. As a, as a, as a, a, you know, kind of everybody's got their own Chrome horror story, you know. But, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I'm really looking forward to this uh, March first. Just go to uh, the Roscoat.com, uh, which is the a website for our podcast. You True. can Google the powder coder podcast too as well. And uh, in the top menu, it says live events and you can just sign up mm. there. Uh, cool. So we're going to have giveaways as well. Um, so we're, you know, trying to kind of get everybody going and stuff, um, some swag and uh, more, much, much more than that. We actually have Good. some vendors that are going to be donating um, a bunch of stuff to the success of this. So, uh, Q and A, all that. We'll try to get it all. In. We're gonna try to fit it all in. <laughs> it's a two-hour <laughs> thing. It's a two-hour thing. So I'm just grateful that these these gentlemen that are on the level of Ross um, are going to you know to to start sharing their mastery with us. You know, so I'm very grateful to them as well because they are masters in what they do. Yeah, it's important for the industry to do things like yeah. this. So thank you to you and Ross for doing this and everyone also to it's participating with you both the so mario how can people get in contact with you follow you all that kind of good stuff um well actually through my linkedin page you can find mario kiseno powder coating and boom they're going to you can add me or follow me uh, i am writing constantly uh, information about powder coating now i'm just focused in spanish for my community, because ooh, there is n there are not a lot of information in Spanish about powder coating, so I'm going to transfer all the knowledge, all my research, to the Spanish community. And yeah, somebody says that uh, uh, preheat the the oven is a key to have a key. Uh, uh, yeah, that person is right. It's uh, it's good to preheat the the oven. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah. Is so critical point. and always have a backup pit. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> Never be caught without a pit, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, that that's a key one there because the last thing you want is for something to go horribly wrong, uh, and not have the minimum you need to keep going. Um, no matter if you're on an island or you're just across town it's still downtime you know you still have yes. to order it uh yeah 
And also, I've noticed that there's been a lot of uh, disruption in equipment. Um, you know, I, you know, we were more concerned about powder disruption during COVID and and chemistry and chemicals and stuff like that. But I, I mean, here's another topic to talk about with you, Jim. You know, is is <laughs> how much equipment is costing these days, and um, and you know, not to mention shipping going up. Uh, but also equipment availability to, you know, yeah. there are things that are harder and harder to get these days. So there you go. I just came up with the next topic. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sounds like the uh, alarm's going off for the oven. You better check. Oh, your oven, yes, Mario. yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, I'm, pre are you, I'm preparing are you powder lasagna. coating in the kitchen. I'm preparing lasagna. Yeah. I have oh, some, yummy. some friends that are coming in uh, an hour. So we are going to eat uh, lasagna, it's spicy lasagna. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Love it. Jim, Jim thank you for your Aww, podcast. It's so nice thank to you, you, Jim, also. I have learned a lot and thank you. I yeah. was really sad when you stopped uh, uh, doing it, but it was a reason, right? But there were lots of reasons, but yeah. Yeah, it's a lot <laughs> of reasons. Yeah, it's I was kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I was having withdrawals myself. I'm, I was getting ready to like call you up and see what was going on, but you were dealing with with Lahaina. I mean, the fires. Oh. I mean, my goodness, the stuff that you know everyone on the island's going through. I just, so. you know, I cry, I cried once on Instagram live, so yeah, I figured yeah. people didn't want to continue to hear me cry. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's still a you know a daily uh, thing. You know. Uh, having to deal with everything that's gone on on this island. I'm happy that we've sort of rebounded. Things get got a little slower. Uh, it was almost like our 9-11 um, yeah. where, you know, like after 9-11, yeah. people just didn't want to participate in anything or, or were distracted by the news or whatever. And it was like a lot like that. And then we're like, ah, you know, um, are we going to survive? And, you know, it's coming back now. We're really, really positive. And of course, Good. you know, the building that's going to go on on this island is going to be insane when it starts to go off. So uh, it's going to take us a little while to get to that point. But, um, you know, they've got it all staged out and and stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Jim, I wrote you in all the platforms. Are you okay? What happened? Are you okay? Please answer me. Please. Yeah, she answers yeah you, you know, I didn't realize like how, um, you know, it, and I don't want to get too deep here, but, you know, when you realize, and it's very hard, it's a very hard feeling to kind of uh, put in your mind. Uh, when you realize that the place that you grew up in, that um, you have all your memories. I raised my kids there. I grew up there. I had done, you know, Ross grew up there. When you realize that it doesn't exist anymore, yeah, it's it's yeah. it's a very unusual feeling because you almost question whether or not your memories are real. Like, did that really yeah. happen? And I got really, you know, obviously I'm getting philosophical about it now, but you know, how do you cope with that? And um, it, I think the people that are living there are sort of, in a sense, in a bubble, like, because everybody else on Maui is just humming along, going to work, doing their thing. And yet there's these people that are still here clinging on in uh, West Maui that, you know, have are going through their own unique experience that is so far and it's going to be generational for them. You know what I mean? So, yeah, uh, yeah. Anyways, yeah. but thank you for missing me. <laughs> we, I'm we back now. You. I'm back now. Yes, I'm back now. <laughs> um, okay. Well, as, as I'm heading out, let me mention that Coding's Talk has a LinkedIn group, and uh, we're building a very strong community for the coatings and the corrosion industry and for professionals and really others that support both industries. This community's purpose is to share members' experiences, their expertise, information, knowledge, passion, and skills, and more. So please join the Coatings Talk community, and I'm looking forward to working with new members like you. Join me next time as I continue our Coatings Talk to dive deeper into topics such as coatings technology, surface preparation, coating application, corrosion control, 
corrosion protection, quality inspection, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to the Coatings Talk channel on YouTube to stay updated on the latest episodes. And I greatly appreciate your support and look forward to bringing you more exciting content on the amazing global protective coatings and corrosion industries. Okay, thank you, and please have a great afternoon, evening, or morning, no matter where in the world you're coming from. Him, thank you. Mario, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Forgive me for my English, but it's okay. Oh, you were fine. understandable, yeah? Perfect. <laughs> oh, <You were> perfect. <laughs> no, it, it was fine. Okay, and thank I you. appreciate you guys so much, and thank you, Jim. I, I look forward to having you on my show soon. Yeah, we can talk um, about right to repair. Yeah, right to repair. We'll continue beating that drum um, <laughs> and uh, so much more, right? Okay. Thank you, everybody.